I'll try to give a few perspectives as, as we see it. Now, um, SEGIS is a part of the Danish Agriculture and Food Council, and our primary focus is uh, on the farmer himself. Uh, so we do quite a bit of uh, R&D, a lot in cooperation with uh, the agricultural departments of the universities in Denmark and, um, and also uh, in other countries. Uh, but mainly focused on the farmer. So, and then we kind of check out when the farmer um, uh, sends his goods off to the to the processing or food industry. But in recent years, also regarding the subject at hand, blockchain, uh, but also uh, the sustainability, carbon footprint, and so on discussion. Of course, you have to look at the full food uh, value chain if you want to document what you do if you want to optimize if you want to optimize your use of resources your uh, lower your climate footprint then you need to document all through the, the chain uh, so uh, but with our primary perspective being on the farmer himself uh, that is just a, a disclaimer. I'm not really from the food industry. I'm, I'm more on the agricultural side. That being said, as we look at it, now, why, um, what is Segis as why? Um, I usually say it's to make farmers, uh, Danish farmers rich and happy. And if other farmers become rich and happy as well, that's fine with us. Uh, so if you look at it from a farmer's perspective, we have not yet come there where the farmer can see a uh, significant effect on his uh, revenue uh, from like blockchain or other documentation technologies. However, we can see that the Danish export of pork to China has risen tremendously. So has it from other countries this is not only due to blockchain, this is due to African swine fever in, in China. But, but still, we do believe that we have been able to access, if you could call it, the upper shelves in, in, in the supermarkets and in the stores, meaning that through a high level of food standards, food safety standards, veterinary standards, but also a high level, level of documentation, maybe, uh, our goods um, may be preferred uh, in competition with others, but the competitors are tough, so they're biting our tails all the time. But we are still a way, a ways away from from complete documentation uh, from from farm to fork. But and I guess this is almost a repetition of what uh, what Fritz was saying. Uh, provides this clarification, this trust, and you have a number of countries. As a Dane, we have a general high trust of uh, food quality, and uh, we trust the Danish veg vegetables, meats, and so forth. Basically, we do, but, but not so in many countries uh, in emerging economies. Uh, so maybe there is an, an advantage there that can increase uh, the trust and thus the price people are willing to pay for a product where you have solid documentation of origin, of footprint, and what have you. If we look at um, the Danish uh, slaughtery um, co-op owned company, Danish Crown, uh, they are clearly the primary drivers. Um, we export about 80% of the pork we make in Denmark. Uh, it's necessary if you want to be an actor in the right price segment uh, across the world that you can document uh, your goods basically and um, so and also i think the demand i um, i spoke to the vice chairman of danish crown a few weeks ago and he said just six months ago when you were talking climate footprint in agriculture the focus was very much on the dairy and the beef industry. No one was talking carbon footprint with pork because they have in general lower carbon emissions. And in just six months with this climate change agenda as the driver, that has changed. Now everybody, every retailer, wholesaler is 
talking about carbon footprint also of pork and sustainability in a broader perspective than just the carbon footprint. And um, so I think the need to document we are actually not greenwashing our goods, uh, our meat, but that we can firmly document that yes, uh, it comes from here and it has an impact of such and such a magnitude um, is becoming increasingly important. So this is also why, plus there's a money issue as well, of course, investment issue, that they are the, the drivers. Uh, and clearly Danish Crown now, now are having an advantage of being owned by the farmers and they own the processing. And so they can document quite a ways away through the food chain and also with whomever they may cooperate with in the, in the foreign markets and uh, logistically wise also. So of course, uh, Danish Crown has been the, the leader here, you could say, the first mover in the Danish food industry, but also with Arla, the big dairy, DLG, Danish Agro, who are in, in grain and feeding, um, are also, uh, well, there should be obvious possibilities. Even though if you take a piece of meat, you would know it would have to come from an individual pig. Whereas if you take a pound of cheese, uh, the milk that has gone into the cheese and the processing can come from a number of cows. So of course, every branch in the food is history or the food industry has a, a different story and a different background that they can build on. But still, with this issue being so high on the agenda, there still should be, um, should be um, possibilities for it. So if I were to eat a, a Danbo uh, in my soft cheese, could I scan the QR code and get a video of the cow running around in the field or, or in the barn? Maybe. Uh, I certainly could with a piece of meat because you should be able to trace that all the way back to the individual pig. Uh, and I think also that, or I think, we think that urbanization and the further away many people move from actual agriculture and the farmer's perspective, the more worried they become. Maybe because of uh, lack in transparency or lack of knowledge, the farmer would always say, the consumer don't know what they're talking about. They should meet us farmers. But, but still, I think this will also drive this need for documentation that, that people are getting further away from where the product is actually produced, which is also why we see urban farming. Um, so, but if you're not, if you can't urban farm uh, everything to feed the, the metropolitan areas, well, maybe you can have solid documentation that not only gives you the uh, objective trust, you could say, but you can also add storytelling to it. And I think uh, that is also a possibility to increase your value. IBM has actually surveyed uh, a large number of consumers in 28 countries. So eight out of, out of 10 say sustainability is important. So if you can document a certain level of sustainability, maybe you can uh, sell your goods at a higher price. And seven out of 10 say they're ready to pay up to 35% more. Now that of that, I would be careful. Uh, a number of years ago, I think this was also Danish Crown or the Danish uh, Pork Producers Council, I'm not sure. But anyway, they would do interviews with people going into the supermarket and say, so uh, what kind of foods are you going to buy today? Are you gonna buy conventional foods or organic foods or uh, whatever? And a large number of people say, we're going to buy organic foods. Now, when they came out of the supermarket again with their carts, then the same person would stand there and see, can I see what you bought? And pretty soon they were threatened with uh, getting beaten upon. So people are not always doing what they say they will do. But still, we have in Denmark seen a steady increase even through the financial crisis and also, th also through Corona, actually. And more and more people are buying organic uh, foods. And I think that's, that is a global trend. Uh, at least in the Western world, in 
in the wealthy countries. So maybe we can use, seen from a farmer perspective, blockchain to not only document origin, but also document sustainability, add storytelling, uh, try to uh, position yourself in the, in the market. And not only blockchain, but digitizing agriculture overall, we see clearly the, the, the climate challenge and the agenda of, of climate change as a not only potential, I should have said driving force because it is a driving force. Now, um, this could be a turning point for the commercial use because not only can you be sure that all transactions are valid through the whole chain, but you can, as mentioned before, also have a much more solid documentation of what is my environmental impact, impact um, my climate footprint and, and so forth. Uh, is it organic? Uh, how are the animals treated? I mean, you can fantasize on and on. Um, and I think this will be an, an important driver because people will be worried with, are we greenwashing? Are we actually telling the truth? Yeah, this is very low carbon footprint, but have we greenwashed it on the way? No, and, and I think, so if you want to address an agenda like the climate change agenda, you should be very careful not to be uh, caught in, in greenwashing or uh, telling the story a little better than it is. And their blockchain technology can also help us in that respect. But for us, as we see it, it's only, uh, it has great potential, but it's only a, maybe not a first step, but, but one of, of more steps that need to interact together. Um, we think that development of decision support system concerning sustainability, climate footprint, resource utilization are essential um, first steps, or at least steps you need to take together with using blockchains with the right tools to optimize your production, lower your environmental impact, uh, um, make better use of your resources. And if we can put that into a blockchain so you can actually document, we took this action on the farm. We tried to optimize such and such. And the outcome was that we had this much, much yield at, at so low use of resources, and then put that into the blockchain. Then you should be in good shape going through the whole chain. So just to give you an example on how can we complement data-driven decision support and management where we are going now from descriptive, now we harvested our fields, the yields were so and so. Uh, what could we have learned for it? We can make a diagnostic approach to it. Well, it happened, but uh, now we can't do anything about it. We can't change it. Moving into predictive uh, tools and then into prescriptive with the prediction looking such and such, then you should actually do this at that time in that specific field or to that specific cow or pig pen or whatever you have. And just to give you an example, uh, in Denmark, with a uh, sometimes cool and quite rainy summer, sometimes dry, um, it's hard to know when you're planting or sowing your grains in, in, in April or late March, um, how much do I sow uh, per square meter? Uh, how much do I fertilize? Because if you had a, have a wet and quite warm summer, the crop will stand very dense and it will be heavy. And when heavy rain comes, there is a risk for the crop falling over. And if this happens, like you see here in a wheat field, you have a loss of yield of about 20 to 40%. So that's quite significant. So many farmers will say, hmm, we will spray uh, a growth regulation, which actually shortens the straw and makes it more stiff, you could say, so it doesn't, uh, fall over as easily. But of course, it takes time, it's expensive, and you don't really want to use more chemicals than absolutely necessary. 
But many farmers say, hmm, we make a spraying plan, so we spray all the wheat fields, then we're safe. Better safe than sorry. We say, hmm, why don't we combine data from, we know, we, we know the crop history, the crop rotation history on this farm, uh, maybe 20 years back. Uh, we know how the weather has been so far. We have satellite images that we can transform into growth or crop density index pictures so we know in which field are the crops dense and in which are they thinner. And combined with a number of large number of field trials many years back, we know when, where are the thresholds for the risk of the crop falling over. So without the farmers having to do anything himself, we can actually advise him that here on the green fields, if you can see my pointer, uh, the risk of the grain falling over, uh, laying down is very low. In the yellow fields, it's medium high. And in the red fields, you should probably growth regulate. We still say, don't completely trust us. Please go out and look for yourself and use your experience and knowledge as a farmer. But still we're trying to make this as a decision support system. Now, two years ago, he would have sprayed the whole thing, no matter what. Uh, today, hopefully, uh, we can ship data out onto his uh, crop manager uh, system that can communicate with the tractor's computer, that can communicate again with the sprayer, and it can also communicate back. So we can put into the blockchain as supply. Now, what did he actually do? He actually did not spray these green fields with growth regulation. Now, if this is uh, wheat made for baking bread, then you have documentation that uh, this was not treated. And we can do it automatically, maybe not right now, but it wouldn't take much to put this into the blockchain. Now, this is just one example. Of course, he has a number of actions throughout the growing season. But if we can combine these decision support technologies with how did he actually apply what he's doing in the field, put it into the blockchain, and then you, this is just one of many actions taken before the bread, the whole grain bread is sitting out in the counter at the bakery or in the supermarket. So yeah, thank you. Um, this was just trying to give a perspective and, and how can we build on and add maybe even more value to where we combine decision support blockchain and, and hopefully, um, get both better documentation, but also make the right and the sustainable, the most sustainable decisions. Thank you.